Hi, I'm Katie, and welcome to Hey It Gets Better. This is the podcast where I chat to people about the ups and downs of their lives and how they got to where they are now. Life can be pretty tough sometimes, there's no escaping that fact. But at Hey It Gets Better, we're all about talking about the journey. I hope you enjoyed today's episode, and remember, hey, it gets better. Hi everyone, welcome to Hey It Gets Better. Today I am joined by Nat and Jess, who both founded Mac and More, which is an agency that combines science and magic to help businesses achieve purpose and profit. So welcome on, on Hey It Gets Better, guys. Thank you so much, Casey. I'm Nat, just to uh, clarify, the excessively northern one. <laughs> and I'm Jess, the uh, southern one. Amazing. I'm so excited. Today's the first time I've had two guests on the same podcast and I can't wait just to unpick your story and how you guys went from redundancy to creating your own agency. So I'm going to start off with a question I normally start off with, which is what are the biggest challenges you've had to overcome to get to where you are now, which I understand is a very big question. <laughs> so um, Nat, if you want to start off um, on picking some of the challenges that you've had to go through to get to where you are now. Sure, why not? <laughs> like you said, it's not, not you know, a big question in any way to launch it with. Um, so yeah, I guess for me, like, and you know, this is very much kind of baked into the um, the story of of inception for Mac and Moore. But for me, I think that I guess the the big challenges that um, really kind of all coincided with one another were as over the period of about a year to eighteen months. Uh, I had two redundancies, so not one, but two um, two redundancies. I had a very big breakup. I therefore had to move out of my house um, and sort of then obviously started a new job off the back of that first redundancy and then I got another one. So um, it really was the kind of situation where I think all of a sudden the train tracks of my life that I was very much kind of chugging along on, um, heading in a particular direction, were completely um, disrupted. and. I think, you know, all of those things individually are quite challenging in their own way, but sort of banding everything together, I think probably the biggest thing I felt was as though my anchor had been lifted. So, you know, even if like you you kind of come across one difficult situation, you feel like you're anchored to your, your house or your flat or your job or, you know, your whatever. Like, so I think that having the kind of rug pulled out under me how many analogies am I going to do in one, <laughs> one answer but basically having those kind of all things all happen at once um really kind of I guess it makes you just like take stock and go you know all those things that you were just taking for granted every single day um or even just the assumption that you're going to head in one particular direction over over the course of a period of years you know things can completely veer off in in an instant and um yeah I think obviously we talked about redundancy there but I think you know the sort of idea of the adversity and the challenges that you face meaning that you can build up that resilience and that armor to protect you going forward from whatever else is going to get thrown at you next and <laughs> I definitely think that kind of had a massive part to play yeah definitely I mean when you said it like all together I felt like that like that tends to just be the start of like a movie plot on Netflix like one of those (laughs) chick flick films (laughs) like all the bad stuff happens at once and then she like rises from the ashes and stuff and but like you know you see that stuff on films and stuff and you don't you never think like it's gonna happen to you you like that but that's just life like throwing you a million curveballs at once definitely yeah and I think that's it you know you you sort of especially with the double redundancy I think that the and and you know off the back of that which was great because we we then set up the business which I'm sure Jess will talk a bit more about but um the the double redundancy is a particularly tricky one because you know you you can sort of accept people's sympathy and people's pity from a first redundancy but then the second one you know you don't want the same like sad eyes looking at you over and over again going 
oh it's happened again right okay (laughs) yeah I can imagine so Jess um how did you get to that point where you got to like creating Mac and Moore what had kind of happened in your story and up until then well um (laughs) I also had a double redundancy, so <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to play tit for tat here, but um, I was equalising with Nat on that level. Um, I think, from my perspective, I felt really disillusioned with the way in which the current sort of world of work, and the way it was structured, what it was offering me. I constantly was looking for some sort of purpose and sort of sense of belonging because the people and the culture were always hugely important to me. And I went to lots of different industries. I started off in outdoor advertising, then went into creative advertising, then into media, and then into tech. And each time I just couldn't really feel like I could find my place. And I know now that that's because I think I was sort of born to be an entrepreneur and do my own thing. But I think at the time I just felt a little bit lost and like I just didn't fit in. So I think the biggest challenge for me was just this limiting self-belief because in my 20s, I kind of put everything on myself that I was failing, I wasn't doing enough. And there was a reason why I wasn't fitting into the status quo, um, the reason why I wasn't feeling fulfilled. And now age 35, I can kind of look back and go, actually, it was because those structures just didn't work for me and that I'm a really independent person and I work better when there's more freedom and I have the opportunity to do work that I really love and work with people that I really respect. So yeah, I think, I think those limiting self beliefs were my biggest challenge to overcome and I've really worked on them over the last couple of years. Yeah, I think definitely a lot of our listeners are in our, like we're all in our twenties and kind of not fitting into the system and the typical nine to five day and the way things work is really really frustrating and it does make you doubt yourself a lot and I saw something where it was like Henry Ford actually came up with the working day when people were like working in manufacturing and it's not changed actually that much since then even though what we do and the creativity needed and the way people actually you know have to do really long commutes has changed the way we work hasn't actually changed as much as really it should have No, and I think that there's a certain control aspect where employees or employers rather don't have trust in their employees. So they feel if they're all sitting at a desk in an office and they can control the time and the output that's coming out of them. But when you're a service based business, especially in the creative industries, you need that time and space. You need to be able to get out of a bubble of an office space to find inspiration and be able to kind of come up with these sort of creative ideas and different ways of thinking. Um, So I think it can really confine you. But I think for a lot of people who are used to hierarchies or set structures um, and want to feel like they have that control, that really scares them, this sort of new way of working. So I think it's going to be really interesting how we adapt after 2020 and the pandemic and to see if if businesses are really going to move forward and, and think differently, because because you're right, it's it's been a system for however many years and it, it's broken and it needs to change. Definitely. So how did you guys um, actually meet? Um, Nat, do you want to tell us how Mac and Moore actually came about when with you two actually meeting each other? Have you always been friends or? No, we, we always... Um... We love this part of the story because it makes it it's always like, you know, a romantic tale of how you met the one. Um, I love being with just like, no, we weren't always friends. I was like, <laughs> we still aren't, no. Um, we so we met um at work. We were both so the, the the most recent redundancy for both of us was a joint redundancy. Um and we'd met working at that company um so basically uh it was a media company and Jess was uh in there before I was and she was head of marketing um I was then there for about three months before uh, D-Day happened and the company went into liquidation and it was just a really interesting time and I think especially looking back now when that was 
what four and a half years ago because I still just remember this feeling of um this is a person who like we we both kind of bring out the best in each other work-wise I'm just probably absolutely like I thought you were gonna be like she was the one for me I was like <laughs> so weird. I remember thinking like you know when we worked together for those three months we we were able just to get so much done because we each kind of uh, had the skill sets that the other person maybe didn't have but we complemented each other really well and so for those three months you know we we did go out for go out for drinks after work and we did get to know each other really well and become become friends but equally like we realized that we we had something quite special between us in this chemistry of how we worked um so we that that's how we met basically and then um three months after we met we were uh sitting on a pavement outside our office drinking <laughs> famously drinking rosé at about 11 a.m um <laughs> and talking about how like how this had all happened and how it had panned out that we were redundant again um and we were just kind of joking around at the time, like I think both of us had kind of felt as though this 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 being wedded to a, a corporate machine and almost this historic notion that being part of a bigger business or an established business is a safe career option, you know, that doesn't exist. Like we've very clearly seen that that doesn't exist. Um, there is no such thing, I don't think, as a safe career unless you were unless you're a teacher or a doctor or something that absolutely isn't going anywhere um so we we were talking about it and we had this idea and we said oh do you know what like why should we just part ways now and go and interview for another company where it's going to be the same situation where the people at the top are making decisions based on you know their their interests not yours um why why was work done this way and also like the internal politics of something like marketing and branding you know in-house it's really frustrating at times because it's not that the best idea wins it's that the person who kind of has the most clout within the company wins or the person who you don't want to upset wins or whatever like you don't get to actually do the work that you know is right and we were really really frustrated by that so we had our we had you know our bottle of wine and then thought about it for a couple of days and then we thought you know what actually there's really something in this there's an opportunity here to create something ourselves to build something ourselves to do the kind of work we really want to do with the people we want to work for and um you know why shouldn't we be why shouldn't we be able to do that so we we basically built Macamore from the ground up um from there that's an absolutely brilliant story from the rosé on the pavement. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering where it was about two minutes long. It was like a manifesto of love. <laughs> but um, I'm going to take a guess and say that it wasn't super easy to create an agency from the ground up. Um, Jess, do you want to like tell us a little bit about any challenges you, you know, experience having to actually do it because having the idea is one thing but actually being successful and still existing four years down the line and doing some great work is another yeah that's that's very true Katie um well I think that I think that there are lots of different challenges along the way and I think it just it comes down to your mindset of how you approach things so I'm a big believer in sort of mental models and a growth mindset really kind of taking on board challenges or failures and kind of rewriting them as ways in which you're learning to be better. So I think the reason why we've kind of stuck together for as long as we have is that I think we've always had an innate trust in each other and what we're building. Um, We both value freedom and autonomy above kind of giving that up and going, going somewhere else. And I think that that, ever sort of changing sort of learning and this ability to meet the incredible clients and people that we get to meet on a sort of daily basis is such an adventure which I know sounds cheesy but I think it's just such a wonderful thing to be able to kind of plot your own course and figure out um, 
your own sort of destiny and where you're going. So there have been challenges. I think it's difficult when you run a business with somebody else, like as Nat said, we're, we're really different people. Um, like I, I'm a, probably a more type A personality and that's really laid back. So I think sometimes there's definitely communication issues and, you know, there's there's been times in our personal lives if we've had issues or difficulties that that's hard to separate um, in, in the business world because we're also real people and those things matter. So, you know, that that's always been a little bit of a challenge. And I think as well, it's just having the confidence as well to sort of pitch ourselves and kind of value our pricing. That's always been a bit of a challenge for us that over the last few years, we've really worked hard at. And I think that's an innately female trait to kind of not value your work as much. So we've done a lot of work on kind of rethinking and sort of realigning to make sure that, yeah, we get paid our worth. Yeah, I think that is, it is definitely like um something that I know like a lot of women and statistically a lot of women struggle with is undercharging for services and also like knowing their worth. I mean, it's a bit difficult when your entire life you get paid less than men historically speaking women have been paid less than men it's kind of all that all the past is like built up and affected our mindsets of today um what kind of work did you guys actually do to realign that then Nat well I think you're absolutely right I think we were we were approaching this from a legacy of kind of ingrained um ingrained uh I guess not yeah just basically like you said we haven't we haven't always been um paid equally and I think that also even within particular um team dynamics I mean the company that I was working for before I worked for the one where I met Jess you know I was I was the only woman on it on the team and I got promoted to management and I remember finding it very difficult to understand why I felt so uncomfortable in certain situations and it is a lot because if you're the only woman in the room or you're the only um you know woman trying to make your voice heard it it can be really difficult to maintain that belief that you deserve to be there and you should be in that room and your opinions and your um worth and your value is absolutely equal if not more than the other men in the room and I think approaching our business from that perspective is is difficult because you do have the kind of imposter syndrome we we hadn't run our own business before so we were new at it and to to then be faced with the challenge of kind of pricing up your services because it is different if you have a product you know you can kind of pitch yourself in the market and um it is different when it's a service and i think that it so depends on your confidence in yourself and I actually think that in a bizarre way, the challenge of how to price ourselves ended up giving us more confidence because at the end of the day, I mean, I handle the finances for the business. And so if I know how much we need to bring in in a particular month in order to get paid, if we don't charge enough or we, you know, we undercharge or undervalue our services, then that's directly affecting us and our, you know, what comes into our pocket. So it's almost as though you you really don't have a choice. It's like you're either going to do this and you're going to suck it up and, you know, be uncomfortable when you maybe put forward a price that is more than you were sort of okay with. But as soon as that pays off, as soon as you do, you know, put a proposal out that gets accepted, you feel like, you know, that is, that is what we're worth and, and it validates you. Um, so I definitely think that the kind of, it's not an overnight thing, but the process of chipping away at that and being like, right, add a bit more on this time. Or did we, did we feel like that was a fair price? Do we feel like we need to up it next time? You know, over the course of time, as we gain more experience and as we, you know, hone our value offering to a business, does that need to be charged differently? Like it's just a constant process of iteration and it won't ever be finished. But I think that almost being comfortable with being a little bit uncomfortable in terms of pitching and pricing things is where is where you need to be. Otherwise, otherwise, you're never going to sort of push yourself to to get what you deserve. I completely agree. And I don't think it um, only applies to sort of like selling a product or a service. I think 
you know, you have it in the salary negotiations and even kind of like in everyday life. 100%. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's, it's definitely not just, it's knowing your worth in all areas of your life. And I think that, you know, that that has to be something that comes from you. I know it's such a cliche, isn't it, to be like, you don't, you shouldn't be able to understand your worth or be validated by other people, which obviously we all do. Um, but I think, you know, if you can have this inherent sense of, your value just as you and, and and what you can bring to any kind of different situation or relationship or whatever then um that's going to put you in the in the best stead for just being content and sort of happy and satisfied in your life that's kind of like I mean I know that's definitely like what I want is to just be content and happy in my life I think everyone gets those days where they are feeling rubbish or they're feeling like unmotivated and things like that and I can imagine like the pandemic for you guys how did you guys manage any sort of stress or worries that you had during that time um I think I think like for everyone whether you're in-house or whether you run your own business um it's that sort of roller coaster effect isn't it I think when it first sort of happened or before it was happening it was almost like oh it won't happen because I think we're used to hearing lots of things in our sort of privileged bubble that we live in here in the UK where things like this don't seem to happen to us um and so I think March and April were almost just like a little bit surreal to be honest um and I think there was a little bit of knee-jerk reaction of just like right we need to push ourselves we need to work really really hard Um, We need to just make sure that we kind of get paid by all our clients. But I think once we'd had a kind of a little bit of a breath and we'd taken a step back and we'd kind of assessed the situation, it felt right to just kind of go with the flow and naturally see where this sort of journey was going to take us. I think that in in a good way, I think Nat is optimistic and I would say I'm a bit of a pessimist, but I like to reframe it as, as a realist so I think that I had a really realistic approach early on about how this pandemic was gonna um unfold so I wasn't under any illusion that we were gonna see any kind of um success in terms of a vaccine or anything straight away so over the summer we just took a bit of a step back and just made sure that we were doing work that we felt really proud of so that when we got to the end of the year we could look back and go, what actually did we do that added value to to people where it really mattered? Are we really living true by our values of thinking about putting people over profit? And does our work have purpose? And I think, yes, we have been affected financially. And there have been times where it's really tricky to see a lot of people who seem to have been flying as a result of something like this in the technology industries or perhaps people on furlough um where they haven't had to work really really hard but they've they've had they've had a paycheck each month um as a limited company we weren't afforded those opportunities but I think that we've done some really incredible work that I think has really changed the nature of our business and us as individuals for the better Um, And I think it's just taught us more to trust ourselves and our instincts. And I feel really optimistic now about 2021 and beyond, because I think if you can get through something as difficult as this, then, you know, the world's your oyster, really. It's great to hear someone who like literally a minute ago called themselves a pessimist or realistic say, I'm really optimistic. (laughs) So... That's... Yeah, that was sorry. I've realized that was that. No, I'm not. I wouldn't say I just I think I challenge. I don't like glib posit- positivity. So I don't like good vibes only. Everyone just feel good all the time. Oh, just shut down any negativity. I don't I don't think we should be around energy vampires and just a- around people who drain you. A hundred percent. There's a time and a place for that. But also we need to base ourselves in reality. Because a lot of the work that we do sometimes is um, focusing on really difficult problems or situations or problems that exist in society today so we have to be honest and realistic about the effects they have and then apply some creativity and strategic thinking and some optimism and how we can help solve those problems so I feel strongly about being realistic but with a positive outlook for the future. 
<laughs> yeah, I think that's brilliant. I think that's really like it relates to kind of what we stand for at Hey It Gets Better is kind of, you know, let's talk about those rubbish times. Those times, for example, when you've been made redundant twice and let's talk about that and how you get end up somewhere better. And I think it's really great to see kind of what the work you guys have been doing and the kind of way some of the people you work with are creating a better world. And it kind of what you've said has come up quite a few times actually in hit like in the episodes we've recorded about f- finding a purpose and make actually having an actual impact on the world and not just bringing home a paycheck but making the world a better place how how did you guys fit like kind of empower yourself to do that now I think it's it's something that we have we have our own ideas on and I think that you know, it is a constant learning process for us. I think to begin with, um, I guess the place to start is kind of going a business, a business itself, you know, it is a commercial enterprise. So as Jess always says, you know, um, we, we don't, we don't want to work with people where money or profit is their primary concern. Um, But equally, you know, it's not a dirty word, like, profit isn't a dirty word and we think that the way to achieve the things that need to be achieved in the world so like the world's to-do list like how can we tick off as many of those things as possible businesses have such an incredible power and influence to be able to um to solve some of those problems you know they are huge um, societal structures and if businesses are run by the right kind of leaders so the ones that you know are able to make money and and to create profit through their product or service but are able to do some good with that money or actually with the product or service itself um you know that to me feels so much more sustainable than say for example um like you said the big corporate machines who've just had a bit of a, a csr initiative of like, oh, you know, we have a charity day once a year. So basically, like, look over here at the shiny charity thing that we do to kind of distract from the fact that they are, like, pumping oil into the ocean or whatever. Um, So I think that we came across this term zebra business, um, which is all about uh, balancing profit and purpose equally and not sacrificing one for the other. And that, to me, is is the recipe. It's, It's the fact that, you know, you can turn a profit but when the chips are down, you don't sacrifice that purpose that you're heading towards. Um, and the the types of leaders that we've worked with who are, you know, either running businesses which are directly trying to solve a problem or they are using their existing kind of um, the way that they work in order to create real change and positive impact. Like, if that's a reason to get out of bed in the morning, for me anyway. And um, it's amazing to see the potential of these kind of founders. And, you know, if if in 10 years time they've achieved half of the things that they've got in their vision, um, vision statement, then, you know, there will be sort of real systemic change that has that has occurred, which will be an amazing thing to have been a part of in some way. That was really great to hear. Um, I think as well from someone who's just graduated this year you feel like you're entering a bit of a like you know a world war disillusion with a world where you don't like how things are running and you want things to change there's so much systematic discrimination in the world the environment is being destroyed like when you kind of leave uni and you it's really hard to see how how you can change it and how you can help it become better but also make a living go to work fund your life because as an individual again it's kind of one of those things where you need money to live but you also want to achieve something in your life as well with purpose no I I agree with you I think that I think I'm so inspired by your generation because I think you, you guys are doing so much more than you know and it's incredible to see amazing businesses that are cropping up from people who are 
in their te- teen years, early 20s, who are coming up with innovative solutions, um, you know, activism as well against all of these different sort of subjects that you've just raised. And I think, you know, I feel for you guys because I think there is a disconnect between the younger generation and the older generation and saying this is the world that we're inheriting and we do care about all of these issues. And I think for me, with the last question that you asked Nat, the number one thing is caring. I remember from my first ever job just going, I want to do more. I want to help people. I want to feel purpose. And you might not find it in a a corporation. You may, everyone's different. But if you don't, you have the ability to go and figure out your own path. And with the internet available to you, that that's now so much easier and affordable than it ever has been before. So like you're doing with Hey, It Gets Better, just put an idea out there, like just be enthusiastic, like believe in yourself. I know it's easier said than done, but I think caring and having passion is like the number one thing that you start with. And then from there, you can build on and anything's possible. That's fantastic to hear. And not only because I'm doing it, but because... I think having these conversations and having people with experience kind of share their le- what they've learned and stuff, it helps with the self-belief of my generation to hear that these things are possible. At the end of the day, sometimes the biggest roadblock in our own journey is ourselves and not actually thinking we can kind of go forward. And being able to change that mindset is so important. Yeah, and I think it's easier possibly for Nat and I to sit here and say, oh, it's really easy. But like we said to you earlier, you know, I had I had crippling self-confidence issues, um, even though I had a stellar CV where I'd worked at some great organisations and worked on some great brands. Like you can sometimes look at these incredible individuals and and put them on a pedestal, but you know that everyone's feeling the same everyone has a certain amount of confidence issues imposter syndrome um we're all the same whatever age we are whatever gender we are whatever time in our life we are so I think it's just having assurance that just trusting yourself caring about what you do will take you on the right path um where that will take you I don't know but that's part of the adventure I think yeah that's super inspiring and it is like really like feel good kind of message um and it's like kind of fitting in with um your mindset Jesse. is um it's not going to be super easy um there's no like kind of positive glamorization of kind of the hustle really here but it will be hopefully worth it in the end yeah it's it's like anything in life it's you know you don't see instant results overnight from anything. I think as somebody as well, who was like off the bat, like, Nat, we need to be doing this. We need to be this successful. We need to have won this many brands. Um, I've learned to give myself a break and go, actually it does take, you know, it has taken four and a half years to get us to where we have for lots of different reasons, but that's because that's the journey behind the scenes. And I know through listening to one of our clients fees, podcast from she can she did all of that is breaking down the kind of glossiness of the hustle and the the business world to go actually behind the scenes it is hard work it is really tough you are battling against not just your confidence but other barriers to success as well but you can do it and when you get those moments where it all falls into place and you get a win or just something just pulls off it's just it just makes it all worth it because you've earned it yeah the victory does sound very sweet there and I think I'd love to get some idea of like quite practical actionable things that you guys might have done either as individuals or um for your business to kind of get through those really tough times whether it's like when at the start of your career or in the making of Mac and more what kind of things that are have you done whether it's mantras, affirmations and things like that to get to the stage you are now? Yeah, I, th- I think I can probably pluck a few <laughs> pluck a few out of my brain from somewhere. So I guess 
a big one I would say is about uh stepping away I think that things can obviously become very overwhelming and especially very quickly when you are where in any kind of work situation I guess would would really apply to this but in our particular situation because we're running a business we're not just doing the things that we are skilled at we are also being a finance director and being a HR manager and being you know all these other things being a salesperson is a big one where that is honestly like my living nightmare and um uh, you know we've had to very quickly adapt and go well if we don't sell ourselves <laughs> not the bad way um but if we don't sell ourselves then who's gonna do it for us like we need to do it so like thing, things can get very overwhelming and I definitely many countless times over the past few years have hit the point where I just go I actually I can't like this I, I don't know how this happens that I'm in this situation but I shouldn't be and I can't do it and just having a moment to like step away from your laptop of your computer your like phone call just t step away and take a few minutes to, or, you know, take an hour or take whatever you need. Like things do simmer down once you've kind of been able to just like check in with yourself. Um, and we always say like, did, you know, nobody's going to, nobody's going to die if you don't respond to an email for two hours. No one's going to die if you like have to rearrange a phone call or like, you know, we're doing marketing, which is we work that we love and we genuinely think we're contributing to the world, but we're not, you know paramedics like we we can just take a step back and go this will be fine we will figure out a way but you don't have to pressurize yourself I think to just be on the hamster wheel and like go 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 like so I definitely think taking taking a step back um is a good one um and then I there is there is a little bit of that old saying of like fake it till you make it and I think that until until I felt confident, particularly in my own abilities as a creative person and as a writer, you know, I knew that I had to just act like I felt like my idea was the best thing ever until I believed it. Um, because if you, if you apologize for your creative, I learned this when I did my master's actually, um, where when we were all encouraged to share creative work around the room, the, the thing that my tutor would always say to us is don't do that thing where you go like, oh, I'm sorry, this is quite rubbish, but like, uh, da, 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 da. like then people are automatically going to think it is rubbish. If you just pitch it confidently and don't do the apologizing that we Brits are so, so good at, then, you know, you're allowing people to make their own mind up and not sort of pre-instating a negative opinion in their heads. I do that all the time as well and it's so annoying and I mean I apologize for things that I don't even need to apologize for like doing work <laughs> and it's it's just something I think you know you kind of I don't know when it starts that you start doing it um but you kind of have to teach yourself out of I mean I'm trying a lot harder now to not apologize for things like Apply, replying to emails the next day when they've come in in the evening I always say oh sorry um, it took me a while to get back to you when it didn't it just took like an evening which is totally acceptable definitely and I think actually that is a really good point around something that Jess and I have been talking about recently um, to do with this whole like uh, cultural landscape of um, you know, what is it to be a woman in business versus a man in business? And obviously, you know, the business world has been created in this very patriarchal structure. That doesn't mean that we need to completely abandon our ways of being or like the things that we feel are right or comfortable or, um, you know, appropriate for us. So it's not, for, it's not for me about never apologizing because we've got to act like, you know, we've never done anything wrong and that kind of thing. It's about apologizing when there needs to be an apology, which I, I think is perfectly the right thing to do. You know, I, if I've messed up, I will absolutely apologize for that. But what I needed to very quickly stop doing was apologizing for things that were purely because I was feeling nervous or uncomfortable or like not confident in um, putting them forward 
So it was safer for me to apologize for it in advance so that then if someone said it was rubbish, oh, well, that's fine because I've already apologized. And that's the stuff where I think like, you know, if you can knock that on the head and just put the, you know, send the email, send the message, do the presentation, send the piece of work and just don't apologize for it in advance. Like that, that's definitely a big learning for me of like, you know, helping, helping yourself to progress. Yeah, that's brilliant advice. And definitely, like, I think there are things in life that we don't need to apologize for and we're doing it. So I think we I end up each episode asking kind of what advice would you give to someone who is feeling really, really like low at the moment, like things aren't going great for them. I think 2020 has been a big year for that kind of thing. Um, Jess, would you like to end on that note with what you would say to someone who just feels like that? Firstly, you're not alone in feeling like that. I I think all of us have had these moments of self-doubt. And as I said, I think you can look at the glossy squares of Instagram and feel like everybody's winning or living a perfect life and somehow you're failing. But just remember that it's not a realistic representation of life um you have to kind of look within yourself and kind of look at your real world environment and try and try and find the sort of positives from that I think in terms of if you're a student or a younger person looking to kind of make that next step in your career just reach out to people that inspire you and you'll be amazed with the amount of people that are actually willing to help or give you some friendly advice or just inspire you to kind of maybe take that creative idea that you've got forward um anything is possible if you're brave enough to put it out in the world and perhaps it won't work out but you'll learn something from it so nothing is a wasted endeavor and just take this time to know that actually I personally believe again through my own journey and through two redundancies we had the worst times gave birth to the best of times and I think that if you can look at life like that and see any adversity that you've managed to overcome as a a huge amount of resilience that you can push yourself forward to create something better in the future you're stronger than you think you are and I think that actually you'll propel yourself to something really great in the future if you have that mindset. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I hope you found it helpful. I really appreciate all the support I get for Hey Gets Better. It would be amazing if you could subscribe to our channel wherever you listen to your podcast. If you want some more content, then you can always follow us on Instagram at Hey It Gets Better. And for more stories of inspiration and resources to help you get through life, visit our website, heyitgetsbetter.com. I hope you have a wonderful week. And remember, hey, it gets better.